All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to our presentation today. I am your host, Scott Hartsall, and we are glad to have you with us. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Optimizing In-Situ Complex Metals Remediation Through Numerical Simulations. And you'll notice that it says part one. Uh, we found that there was so much information to present that we actually broke the presentation into two parts. Part one will be presented today by Jim Schutz, and we have a second part that will be presented by Melanie Beck next month on August 11th. So I hope you can join us for that as well. Before we get started, a couple of logistics and housekeeping issues. We will be trying to keep phone lines muted to reduce background noise. So if you have a question during the presentation, you have two options. You can type your question into the chat feature in Teams, or you can hold your question until the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we'll go through both of those uh, during the Q&A session. Also wanted to say, I'm sorry, but we're still waiting for the final decision by ACEC on whether we will be approved to award CEU credits for today's presentation. So if you're interested in continuing education and looking for the credits, if you could send an email to me at scott.hartsall at parsons.com, I will see that you get the sign in sheet uh, when and if we find out for sure that we are approved. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Jim Schutz. Uh, hydrogeologist and technical director for Parsons, uh, who will start us off for a value moment. Thank you, Scott. Welcome, everyone. I'll skip ahead to the core value moment. So for today's core value moment, I would like to bring up diversity in, in, and inclusion, which I think is a very relevant topic, especially to remediation um, and sciences and engineering. I think we can all recognize the advantages of having a diverse and inclusive um, work environment, as well as a, a discipline such as geology or environmental science or engineering. And I encourage everyone to look towards avenues where you can actually make and uh, a, a real credible change. And sometimes it goes beyond just you know giving money to an organization. Um, but actually investing in, in an organization. And there's uh, there's a lot of very small grassroots types of organizations, and I'm showcasing one here. And full disclosure, I'm on the, the board of SPEC, which is Sustainable Progress and Equity Collective. And it's a great organization because it really like activates um, activates the ideas of in, of diversity and inclusion through very specific mechanisms that I've list listed down here. Mentoring and training. We have research assistants that come up through the system and we're able to get them into leadership positions or get them into the work environment. Um, there's very specific programming and outreach. And what I really like is the development of um, micro credentials, which if you're not aware, they're small sort of bite sized pieces of information of lessons and, and learnings that um, folks can can um, become credited in and grow a collective of micro credentials. So, you know, I inspire everyone to encourage everyone to, you know, look for um, look for organizations that you can become uh, invested in and, and really make change. And especially now that there's um, there's things like the Open Collective Foundation here, which I think is great because as a small organization, it takes a big hurdle to become a 501c3, which is, not, which is a not-for-profit. And if you've been involved in any organizations, you can recognize the financial and administrative work that it takes to become a 501c3. But with the Open Collective Foundation, we fall under the umbrella of the Open Collective, which um, which is highly useful for small um, startups like like spec. And moving on. First of all, I'd like to make acknowledgments to the team. Um, this is again a part one of a two series sets of set of presentations. We'll get into a lot more of the site specifics in next month. Um, but just to recognize some of the team member here because it's not about um, me doing the work. Frankly, it's about the team and what we can achieve together. So Julian Chambers has been vital to the team in terms of organizing and doing a lot of the serious science and engineering. Jim Shaw has 
been able to do a lot of the, our pilot testing over the years um, at many of our sites and is really a key leader in making things happen on the ground as they should. And Glenn Ulrich, um, who's um, critical to our, our team in terms of thinking innovatively and his, his micro ecology experience um, really brings in a, a new uh, a new level and a new discipline to our our classic um, in situ remediation team. Paul Feshback Marini, um, who's a hydrogeologist, but also just a astounding leader and project manager. And Melanie Beck, who will be presenting next month, um, is just a great groundwater modeler and hydrogeologist who you'll get to uh, see present next month. All right, so. This is a two part series. This is part one, which is really fundamentals. The purpose of this of today's presentation is to go over some of the details that really led us to the fate and transport modeling that we're doing on a, on a site specific um, project that we'll go into next next month. Um, we wanted to break down more of the details, especially with the arsenic mobility, which I think is useful um, for folks that are, are joining because of the you know, potential for arsenic at one of your sites. And and I wanted to really break down some of the modeling processes um, a, a little bit more before we get into some of the site specific details. Um, off to the right here, this is not one of our photos, but um, this is a photo from uh, Wada Mahmoud and from the University of Jordan. And we're going to talk about iron and we're going to talk about arsenic and we're going to talk about sulfides. So I found this um, this image here, which is a scanning electron microscope image, just stunning. And to reflect back on the core value moment, this is, you know, I, I love these types of images because they represent the intersection of art and science. And that's one of the ideas of diversity and inclusion, right? Is to bring in more perspectives and think about things differently. And when we see this intersection of art and science, like this very cool um, image of iron on soil, it gives us another perspective. It, it um, makes us think differently. Moving on. So the first couple of slides here, I'm really talking about some of Parsons um, approaches to groundwater modeling and how we try to weave that into other Parsons um, Parsons processes. So we try to do uh, we, we do adaptive groundwater modeling. Um, what that means is we make it piecewise and scalable. We usually have multiple objectives and we try to commit to those objectives along the way, depending on the size of the groundwater model. Um, but also we like to build complexity as necessary. So one of the foremost um, principles in, in groundwater modeling is the principle of parsimony, which essentially means build complexity as necessary. And, and that's very relatable to the groundwater remediation fields because we may have small projects that you know wouldn't necessarily have the budget for a very significant uh, groundwater model, nor would you need it. But that doesn't preclude it from using a more simple groundwater model. Um, and of course, we may have very large projects with very um, you know with with very significant risk ramifications where fate and transport model, for example, on the far right here would be applicable. And you see across the bottom, you know, our different um, disciplines and how we like to use groundwater models from mathematical testing to quantification of our conceptual model to remedial design where we start thinking about flow rates and injection systems, recirculation systems. A lot of that's applicable to these two presentations that we're doing this month and next month in terms of using mathematical models to really help understand and help optimize a remedial design and or a pilot test. We use them throughout optimization. So even once you're in, let's say a pump and treat, you might want to use a groundwater model in order to help with the verification that the that the hydraulic heads and the potentiometric surface maps that you're generating, you know, the the, the hard data that those are representing the site correctly. But you might also want to look towards using groundwater model for um, optimizations in terms of flow reduction and maybe you can reduce your monitoring well network and having a quantitative tool such as a numeric model or an analytical model um, can help 
provide some basis for those decisions. Lastly, fate and transport models, which sort of um, you know involve not only the groundwater flow equation, but also the uh, reactive transport equations, which I'll get into later. Um, those really help with um, our plume predictions and our natural attenuation analyses. Secondly, um, we like to apply our groundwater models to what we call our site progression processes. So um, what that means is, you know, you see this arrow along the bottom here. So this is sort of how our sites progress. We start out with, you know, site characterization, and these are general categories, um, remediation and feasibility studies into design, into construction, and then into OM and M. Well, off of each one of these nodes, you can see how groundwater modeling can really help support in terms of initial mathematical testing, uh, quantitative conceptualization, and I make a note about being scalable here because even though we may be starting out at um, node one in site characterization, we might need to look back to this groundwater model um, when we're out here in construction, and if so, we need to make it scalable. Moving along, you know, as you go into remedial investigation feasibility, we increase complexity, improve boundary conditions, calibrate complete sensitivity testing, then again into design. We end up with a you know, higher level of uncertainty oftentimes, and we're thinking more about risk mitigation and refinement of safety fa and safety factor and optimizations. And then lastly, um, in OM and M, we're often looking to demonstrate effectiveness and make refinements of, this, of systems. What the presentation this month and next month is about for a site specific example is looking at a site that is in ONM long term pump and treat for arsenic and reconsidering that original um, remedial design and saying, hey, maybe pump and treat is not the best option for remedial design. So we're, we've looked at the project and gone back um, in order to reconsider do we want to be pumping and treating for a very long time or is there a better, more effective, more efficient, more sustainable remedial action for an arsenic plume? Which is the case that I'll be building throughout the fundamentals presentation this month and next month will be that um, you'll see the case sort of laid out in the groundwater model and the site conditions itself. So next, I'll talk about the fundamentals of arsenic remediation. And if anyone has had or does have an arsenic site, I think you can appreciate a lot of the difficulties and challenges that arsenic represents. And we'll go through that in a few different ways um, and really come to uh, um, these four considerations that will that you will eventually see as conclusions to our analyses. Um, so what do we think about in terms of remediation considerations for arsenic? We have plume duration. How long is it going to be there? That's a question everybody wants to know. What's the arsenic source that relates to plume duration? And it relates to plume longevity and, and as well as distance. Bait and transport biogeochemistry. As you will see here today, the biogeochemistry is very related to this bait and transport. Um, and as, like I said, as you will see, the dynamics of arsenic mobility are, are quite a challenge when it comes to our classic approaches to treating um, general pollutants. And then what do we have for in-situ treatment options? I think we all recognize that pump and treat is a containment system, not necessarily a remediation system. It takes many years even to pump and treat a chlorinated solvent plume or um, a hydrocarbon plume. Um, you can have lingering residual contamination that um, sustains a plume for a long time. So, you know, over, and this is nothing new at this point. It's been 20 years of implementing um, innovative in situ treatment options at a variety of types of sites. So some general chemistry about arsenic that I would like to introduce here to help everyone understand why it's so specific 
um, and, and why we're looking at a very innovative type of approach for arsenic treatment um, beyond what may traditionally have been done. This is a phase diagram, and the way you read a phase diagram is you can see the little um, polygons here. Those represent different phases of a compound. So in this case, we have arsenite, which is down here in this phase. I bring that up just as an example. What, what this means is when you have a certain EH and a certain pH, you end up with a certain compound. So EH, pH diagrams are very common in aqueous geochemistry. I think a lot of folks on the call here are aware of that. Um, and what does it mean in terms of arsenic? Well, EH is, you know, essentially ORP. It's the electron activity. So as you are positive, you know, this is um, ORP above zero. And as you are negative, this is essentially ORP um, as a negative. Since arsenic is such a complex um, species, it really it really depends on where it lands on this EHPH diagram in terms of mobility versus immobility. The um, dark polygon up here that you see, this is the zone of arsenic immobility. And this is a readily available paper on the internet, by the way, by David Vance, and um, it's published through the National Environmental Journal. And it, it really shows uh, arsenic um, as it exists in an immobile phase for oxidized water. You notice that here, oxidized water, water reduced. Again, EH first and, and increase in EH and a decrease in EH um, above and below zero. And then obviously pH. We probably all recognize that metals um, are very susceptible to solubility um, when you get at a certain low pH. And sometimes some metals are amphoteric and dissolve at a high pH as well. What I'd like to point to um, on this EHPH diagram beyond what I've already pointed to is the fact that we have ferric iron along this red line and ferrous iron and below. So that's the key to this zone of arsenic immobility. You can see how it um, follows the ferric iron, fer ferrous iron line. What we're gonna be talking about today is not only the immobility of arsenic as related and sequestered with ferric iron, but thinking about it from a different perspective. And there's a zone of arsenic immobility not shown here that relates to ferrous iron and a reduced groundwater state, i.e. anaerobic. So that is also represented here by another paper. This is um, a study out of uh, Bangladesh um, by the authors that you see here. And this one really represents a couple of things. And I bring it up because it shows in a natural environment how complex arsenic um, solubility is. And it also puts us and sets the stage for why we have such difficulties with arsenic in our um, anthropogenic sites, which have been impacted by um, pollutants from humans. And what you notice here, and I'll start off on the left, it's really about a cycle here, but we have um, arsenic and sulfide coming into a system. And this is all, again, oxidized. We'll be bringing up these same concepts again and again, oxidized and reduced. So this is a positive ORP and a negative ORP. What I showed on the last slide um, is that when you're oxidized, you're more likely to precipitate arsenic. And that's what's happening here as um, the sulfate the iron and the arsenic um, form into this iron oxide. And you can see the arsenic um, essentially tagged onto the side of it. And that's the sequestration where arsenic um, essentially binds to the iron oxide. As this system goes anaerobic, so now we're going down into the reduced zone, um, typically because of organic carbon, and in this case, because of the wet season, now, um, arsenic and iron become more mobile and dissolve out. And when you have a limited amount of sulfate, 
arsenic is now mobile and can turn into a plume. When you have um, the right chemistry, you can actually get um, the arsenic sulfide to, um, again, um, precipitate out. What you end up with in this form is this cycle as related to oxidizing and reducing conditions where arsenic is in and out of its dissolved and um, precipitated state. So that's the temporal changes. And you can think about that not only from a temporal perspective, but also in space. A lot of our plumes have a localized anaerobic zone. And then beyond the localized anaerobic zone, you have an aerobic zone, and that helps with the arsenic and its um, precipitation and, and to some degree can limit the extent of the plume. So let's also talk about arsenic longevity. I'm a third paper here um, and uh, a third paper about arsenic longevity. Um, you can see here we have a benzene plume and an arsenic plume. And what this represents is benzene concentrations as they decrease over time in this sort of smooth um, path. And this is uh, some model simulations and this is aquifer volume. You end up with a spike in arsenic over time because of that anaerobic state and arsenic dissolving off of natural um, minerals. And, and you notice the years here. So we're out at 100 and 200 years. So the, the conclusion of this study um, is that we may have arsenic for centuries, which is a bit of a concern, especially if you have a pump and treat system. Um, and as a side note, um, Parsons has been no, I'm working from home because. Um, as a side note, Parsons has been um, in in conversations with Dr. Casarelli, who uh, may be willing to speak at one of our upcoming webinars. So it'd be great to uh, to hear from her. All right, so let's get into a little more site specific. What does this look like? Um, I'm going to talk about one of our sites. Um, and it's sort of a jump off to how we've seen and what we've learned at one site, and then we'll go into some of the, the fundamentals of the groundwater modeling. What I'm setting the stage for here is we the, the nuances of arsenic and how we need to think about them a little bit differently than we may think about other types of contaminants. Um, the, the summary here, this site's got a lot of arsenic spread around it, but we're going to look at this section here which is where some of the treatability testing that you'll see is. Um, there's very high concentrations of arsenic in soil, so that's 10,000 uh, milligrams per kilogram. And then even the blue here is also very high, so very shallow, high elevated concentrations of arsenic on soil. And then a plume that essentially migrates down gradient towards, uh, towards um, what is actually a river on the edge of the property. So we looked at this site and developed some concepts in order to say, OK, how can we think about this differently? Maybe there's a different way to treat arsenic and create an immobile phase. But in order to get there, we needed to look a little more at the site specifics. So here is saturated soil um, of sources of arsenic and groundwater. So on the x-axis, we have saturated soil arsenic. So these are the arsenic concentrations of the saturated soil, and these are the groundwater concentrations. And what you notice here um, is a relationship in terms of increases in soil arsenic versus increases in groundwater arsenic, which is pretty straightforward in what we would expect. What you can also appreciate is um, how there's also a a secondary source of arsenic as a plume migrates out forward from the source area, because again, these are all saturated soils based on the unsaturated soils above. So the migration of arsenic into the aquifer has actually created sort of a longevity. The analogy for a lot of us would probably be back diffusion. This is not back diffusion. It's really about 
how arsenic exists in its relationship to ferric and ferrous iron. So as you see here, ferric iron and soil with adsorbed arsenic. And this box is, um, you know, yellow, reddish brown, for lack of a better word, maybe orange. Um, and that represents oxidized environments, you know, so iron staining that, that we often see in the shallow water table or above the water table. We all, we all know that's from um, essentially iron staining in an oxidized environment. And that's where you end up with ferric iron and arsenic absorbed to it. Once you end up with microbial iron reduction, so as you pass to our gray uh, hexagon, as you pass to the gray hexagon down here, that represents anaerobic conditions. And then you see it's Fe2 plus arsenic, um, which is then dissolved in groundwater. And we can all recognize this in, as, you know, as a soil profile where we end up seeing the iron stained soils above and then some um, anaerobic soils, which are typically gray. So we see this uh, along the entire thickness and vertical, vertical extent of the aquifer, and it really represents a secondary source of arsenic for minimally decades. When we originally started studying this site, and I'll jump back up to this map, you know, we had historical data in this area. And um, while Glenn Ulrich has done the last, you know, five or 10 years of study at this site, I, I originally started plotting some of these arsenic concentrations and really noticed the plume the way it exists here, especially at depth. We didn't have a good explanation for it. We knew that the ORP was low, so we sort of anticipated, yeah, the ORP is low, oxygen is being consumed at depth. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but looking in the boring logs, there wasn't a lot of detail on like why that might happen because it's a pretty shallow aquifer and it's sand and it's not, you know, migrating big, long distances. Um, so we sort of started to question, well, oxygen is being consumed, but we didn't have as good of a mechanism as we do once we started drilling more data. So we drilled for pilot testing and further characterization, and that's what you see here. So increasing depth with low concentration of dissolved arsenic. And then we have very high concentrations of dissolved arsenic. And like I said, that was recognized and just sort of assumed to be because oxygen was being depleted, et cetera, maybe because of the plume, maybe there's some hydrocarbons. And then what new data showed us and, you know, and, and these cores, especially as opposed to maybe a split spoon sampling is a layer of peat in here. So thin layer of peat, thin layer of peat, not enough to really block the plume or cause you know, a uh, semi-confining unit, but just enough that as groundwater, you know, again, top to bottom here, as groundwater moves downward through these cores as they stack in, you know, in reality, it goes through the peat and then down below the peat, we end up with, you know, this very high dissolved phase arsenic. So, Great example of additional field work and some additional studies that improved the characterization and improved the um, the recognition of okay we have dissolved phase arsenic and why do we have it? This here is uh, another um, study and representation of the duration and migration of arsenic, and what this really shows here is a couple of things. Um, you know, the red is sorbed, so that's irons, uh, that's arsenic probably sorbed to iron. This is dissolved phase. There's this loading period, which um, probably represents a change in anaerobic state due to a, a plume. And then this time at 80 years becomes source removal. Now, even, there, even though there's a source removal, we end up with a sustained sorbed um, level of arsenic and a depleting but 
you know, taking a long time to deplete dissolve phase concentration. So we still have, you know, the, the source removal manifested a significant change in the concentrations. But if you're interested in, you know, concentrations being down at 10 micrograms per liter, you can see this is milligrams per liter. Um, you can see that arsenic um, can be a, sustain, a sustained source because of the initial loading of the plume and the change from aerobic to um, anaerobic state. All right, so, so how do we look at this um, in terms of our options for a remedial action? So if we look to the center here, this is our current condition. And we have ferrous iron in soil. We have Fe2 and arsenic-3 in groundwater. So this is dissolved phase. That re represents our problem. That re represents our, um, you know, our pollutant, and we need to remediate it. Option one here is what would probably be a more classical approach in terms of in situ biogeochemical adaptation in that we can have iron ox oxidation, abiotic and microbial state of change, which changes the iron and becomes more aerobic and arsenic then sorbs um, basically to the iron in soil. So again, this brown represents, um, well, this yellow brown color represents an oxidized environment. If we can initiate this abiotic and microbial change in iron oxidation, then we can sequester the arsenic out of the groundwater and essentially treat the plume. One of the difficulties with this is, you know, how do we do this oxidation? A lot of times you might oxidize an aquifer, you know, by injecting air in the ground or something, which, which is a credible way to do it. However, if once you turn off your oxidation system, your, oxi your oxygen becomes consumed, and then you end up in this cycle, like I was showing earlier, where arsenic comes out of solution, but then makes its way back as a dissolved phase due to iron reducing bacteria and hydrocarbon biodegradation. So this loop becomes an issue in terms of remedial option one, you would essentially have to continue oxidizing the aquifer if you went with this type of remediation. So looking at it from a different perspective, and it's a, it's a good reminder for you know, our chemistry 101 and that oxidized state versus anaerobic state, that's not necessarily the presence of oxygen. That's more about the electron transfer in terms of reduced conditions or oxidized conditions. You can have reduced conditions and not, or you can have oxidized types of conditions and not necessarily need oxygen. And to that point, you can drive arsenic out of solution in an anaerobic state, which is remedial option two here through sulfate reduction with hydrocarbon and biodegradation. We end up with iron sulfides in soil. These iron sulfides adsorb or precipitate or precipitate out the arsenic. So what this challenge and what this represents is a decision point of how do we essentially remove arsenic from its dissolved state. It's very difficult to just take all the arsenic out of the ground because it exists on many minerals. So the preferred option for institute arsenic remediation is typically to try and get it out of its dissolved phase and get it to adsorb or precipitate onto iron, and in this case, iron sulfides. So a little bit more before we move on to the groundwater modeling perspective. Um, we've done some treatability testing, and this is a good case 
which I'll which will lead right into um, some of the decisions that we make with groundwater modeling is um, in these. So each one of these are a treatability test. We look at aeration. We look at aeration with iron sulfate. So that's important to note. Ferrochloride. Each one of these um, does not have a sustained longevity, and you notice that by these arrows where we have an increase of arsenic um, due to a lack of sustained geochemical conditions to keep arsenic precipitated out. Here in the middle, we have iron, iron sulfides, and you notice how flat those concentrations are over time. So orders of magnitude reduction without a so-called rebound, if you will. So conclusions, plume duration can be centuries. Um, we always have a low um, MCL in terms of where we need to get to with the groundwater concentration for remediation. Um, anthropogenic naturally occurring, um, both can change with time. Distribution can migrate and disperse. And again, general variability in time and space native versus plume redox conditions. These are all challenges that we face and arsenic scavenging minerals. You know, we need to incorporate those into our remedial design. A couple of options here that we've explored and have been implementing are PRBs and full plume treatment. So lastly, on treatment technologies, what we're looking at in terms of our sulfate injections for treatment of arsenic. It's um, it's basically a takeoff of Parsons patented Napa away product, which treats l napple but it can also help with the precipitation of arsenic through what you see here um, in the creation of iron sulfides. Again, here we have that um, iron rusted color oxidized soil pass below the water table. It's anaerobic. We have iron sulfides. How do we maintain these iron sulfides capacity of sequestering the arsenic. And that's what we're looking to with some of our pilot testing and the sequestration of arsenic. An example of that, how do we want to treat a plume? Um, we pump out of the ground at a down gradient well. We keep this water anaerobic. That's very important. We keep this water anaerobic. We mix in sulfate and then we inject it into the aquifer. We have the groundwater flow. And as the sulfate migrates down gradient, it sequesters the arsenic through sulfide minerals. This concept, which I think everybody can understand, is really important in terms of the groundwater modeling and how you would want to model this system. The whole point of our groundwater modeling component to these two presentations is bait and transport modeling for sulfate. Now, sulfate as you'll see in the next set of slides, has very particular conditions that require very particular groundwater modeling aspects, more so than some of our other in-situ treatment technologies, which we apply groundwater to. So moving on to the groundwater model component, and again, these are fundamentals. So this is really about um, educating the team, educating um, everyone on the call, um, so that everybody can get a little bit more of a look behind the curtain in terms of groundwater modeling. And um, again, in the spirit of openness and education, which technical, which our Parsons technical webinars represent, um, really showing some of the, the details that, that we go through as modelers and how we model a site. And I think the more informed we all are, whether it be project managers, geologists, engineers, regulators, clients, the more we all understand what's happening in our groundwater modeling, the uh, the better off we are. So this diagram here, which is going back to one of the first mod, mod flow articles, really shows the flow path of our groundwater modeling process in terms of you know deciding on a model, collecting field data, doing calibration, verification, prediction, presentations of results, and then a post audit. And sometimes 
you revert back to your original conceptual model because you've learned something about your site from your post audit in comparison to your field data. I bring up these three components here, purpose, objective, and process. Those are critical to any groundwater modeling exercise. Here's a site specific example of a process diagram in where we bring in, we start to bring in field data through different types of information, regional, um, classical groundwater modeling or groundwater testing in terms of aquifer tests and hydraulic conductivity evaluation. And then we might have, you know, some three dimensional modeling that we can bring in. We develop the model structure. We start out with initial runs and testing. We hopefully have a nice static conditions data set to compare to in calibration. Um, we continue calibration with what is typically done for us with PEST, which is a parameter estimation tool, and that helps us with um, running the model hundreds of times to produce um, good sound calibration. Ideally, you want to be able to have some pumping conditions to recalibrate to and then update static conditions based on the pumping conditions and then eventually move down here into our fate and transport development and our pilot testing. Oftentimes, in let's say a uh, vegetable oil injection that's short in distance and time and we don't need a lot of uh, we don't anticipate a lot of reaction components we can exit this process somewhere in here and and go right to pilot testing um, so this would be our pilot testing over here we might not need the fate and transport model develop but as i'll show today with sulfate um, i'm sorry with um, arsenic and sulfate injection, it's important to think about fate transport. Mod flow, just to, I'm going to quickly go through some of the mod flow history here um, for those that are aware of it and give a little bit more uh, detail to how it grew up and why that's important for where we're at now. Um, mod flow is developed as a modular package. This diagram here is akin to 1980s where everyone had a stereo system and different components to that stereo system got plugged in instead of this being the evapotranspiration package you know the the analogy here is this was your record player and this was your cd player although cds didn't exist in the 1980s but i think you get my point um it's modular that is the point mod flow is developed as a modular numerical groundwater flow model so that they recognized later in in history, they would want to be be able to bring in different packages for, like, say, the river package or the basic package, and it evolved over time. Mod flow is a numeric model, so it typically works with structured grids. But as you'll see in recent years, it's moved on to unstructured grids, which is a phenomenal change. It is not a black box. Um, any groundwater modeler should be able to get inside the black box and know what the details are. Everything is very accessible with mod flow. You can read its input files um, as text files. You can read its output files. And in fact, everyone I work with, you know, we all make sure we go to the output files directly because there's information that you can get from those files. Early history, you know, started out in 1983, moved on to 1988. A lot of this wasn't much of a change. 1996 was kind of a cleanup of 1998. Um, about 2000, things start to improve with new solvers the stream and saturated flow packages, and then we're able to do some parallel computing. This is all Fortran work. So, you know, Fortran goes back to this 1966, um, but it's evolved over time as well. There's even updates to Fortran, um, I think, more recently. The, as ModFlow evolved, 2005 really became um, a paramount change in mod flow and I, I'll bring that up as I get into details of the NWT, the Newton formulation, which is this was a new solver that really overcame a lot of the hurdles of a numeric model and convergence issues that um, sort of were present in complicated models pre-2005. More recently, mod flow USG. Um, that's important because that does not mean USGS, that means mod flow unstructured grids, where now we're able to not only um, we're not only be able to refine our grid, but we can refine our grid without having to telescope it. And you'll see a telescoped version of that. What that means is we can keep our little cells 
and square cells, which helps with the way numeric models work in that um, flow is coming in across similar size faces um, in terms of, let's say, number 16 here. And you'll get a better appreciation for that when you see an uh, unstructured grid, which I'll get to. Without getting into a lot of the detail here, um, I could go on and on, but I'll try not to. Um, this ghost node correction is paramount to being able to um, do this type of nested grid, as it's shown here. And again, NWT is still a very useful package because of its um, its sparse matrix solver and its upstream weighting package, which I'll talk about in a second. Modflow USG was not developed by the USGS. It was sort of developed in collaboration, but this group here um, led by sort of Panday de developed USG, and then eventually it became integrated into Modflow 6, which is a USGS product. It has very similar design and structure. All right, Modflow NWT. So we all talk about Modflow. Now this, now you know, we're looking inside the engine essentially when I talk about NWT. And what was great with MWT is it improved a lot of the rewetting options and improved our well flow package solutions. So if you've talked with your groundwater modelers, they may say, "Oh, I'm not getting convergence. I'm having these problems. I'm ha having those problems." And you know, those actually manifested into significant cost for some of our older groundwater models as they were adapted in the past, because a lot of the buildup for numeric groundwater modeling is getting the solution to work. And that may sound funny because um, we all think math just works. Well, numerical modeling, and if you've seen my other presentations, um, numeric modeling is an adaptation of mathematics, which doesn't always converge on an actual solution, but that's for another day. I did want to bring up the upstream weighting package because this is a, a great adaptation in MWT and it includes a horizontal conductance function, um, which overcome, overcame a lot of the um, cell drying and to provide a continuous derivative. So the continuous derivative in the forms of this quadratic actually ca causes or creates a smoothing effect. And so the, the linear solution is the blue line. Um, X is um, the saturated thickness of the cell, and then Y is the smoothing function. That smoothing function, which was a mechanism to improve convergence for cell drying issues, um, that was actually improved a lot through the adaptation of this quadratic and um, being able to smooth more effectively at the ends of this line. Going on, NWT had a few other um, very paramount um, improvements in terms of how it treats the cell by cell flow and what it actually does with cells that dry is it um, prevents conductance between these cells, which I won't get into in a lot of detail here because I'm being mindful of time. Um, but if anybody's interested, we can go into these details more and you can contact me directly. So structured versus telescoped grids. Um, here's an example of a telescoped grid, and you notice how it looks a little bit intimidating in the fact that we have very tiny cells here and very large cells, well, very long, skinny cells out here. This has always plagued the numeric modeling groundwater world because we want to be able to zoom in on site specifics and show you know what's happening in this tiny little cell here, but we need to cover a big space. We need to push our boundary conditions out away from our area of interest, and in doing so, we either have too many cells, if we keep this a uniform mesh, too many cells then can actually solve in a, um, in a credible time, or we have to telescope out. And when you telescope out, you end up with numerical instability issues and water balance issues, because now, you know, you can see here we have such long, and I'll draw it over here, we have such long skinny cells and we're calculating, mod flow is calculating water into and out of these cells um, on a face-by-face -face basis. And when 
these very thin, skinny cells are implemented in a model because of the telescoping, you end up with um, with numerical issues, especially in your water balance, because a little bit of error happening many, 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 many times out here where everything is so um, elongated, it causes, um, again, numerical instability or at least water balance issues. So ModFlow USG came out and the ModFlow world was like, holy cow, this is, um, this is fantastic. I can't believe we're able to do what we can do with ModFlow USG. Some of it's still in research and not all the packages work with it, but here at Parsons, um, we've been able to really develop and push the push our models into the newest structure. And a lot of that um, has happened um, through uh, my colleague, Melody Beck, who will be presenting um, next month. She's really been able to adapt our modeling processes for USG quickly. And because of that, we're much more efficient and have a much um, more effective and cost, cost effective modeling approach. So here you can see we have a rectangular grid, we have a nested grid, and we have a quad tree grid. And what that means is now we can look very specifically at tiny little details within a much larger grid. So big grid cells out here, but they're all squares. So the flow into and out of these cells, and this is a no flow boundary, so that doesn't really apply, but I think you get it, into and out of these cells, it, it just makes more sense, right? It's, a, it's just more logical in that in numeric math when the model's like just calculating flow across all the cells all at once and trying to converge on something. Convergence means it's reducing the error between all those cells when those cells have very odd shapes or very elongated shapes and differences on um, on the, the face of each cell, you end up with uh, convergence problems, which are corrected here with the adaptation of ghost nodes to go out of a big cell into many little cells. Okay, fate and transport. I um, showed a little bit of the groundwater flow equation, um, but the fate and transport equation is here. I'm going to really focus in everybody on what's important here. Um, you know, we have porosity, we have concentration. Everybody thinks about our seepage velocity. You know, that's Darcy's law, as it shows here. Um, hydrodynamic dispersion. All those are are you know typical flow model um, type of type of parameters, except for the hydrodynamic dispersion. But you can do most of this with a flow model. Is my point. Um, the important part of fate and transport really comes down to this chemical reaction term. So now we're involved in concentration, dispersion, and this chemical reaction term. What is chemical reaction? Here's the reaction term. Bulk density, concentration of species, first order decay rate for dissolved phase, and first order reaction rate for sorbed phase. Most importantly, we're talking about this parameter in terms of bait and transport modeling for an inject date. And what that means is without the fate and transport rate, without the without the reaction rate, i.e., the decay rate of your substrate, you may not be accurately depicting how your inject date is going to work over time. Um, We've done and I've presented on this stuff, so I won't get into it in the, into it here, but I wanted to show, you know, these are just ways you can complete pilot testing efficiencies through groundwater modeling from a flow only perspective. So injecting into a trench and, you know, we did a bunch of modeling and ended up with, you know, a very nice um, uh, cost analysis in terms of our well spacing. So well spacing, and then cost per linear foot of trench. We're able to identify like in here, we're optimized. We can also do trait of um, bait and transport modeling without the reactive term and look at injections of, of uh, non-reactive, um, i.e. non-degrading injectate, and you can see that here. 
in terms of we injected in an injection well, we had a monitoring well, and then you can see the triangles here um, where we're now fitting it to our model output in order to help identify what the dispersion was. Back again to sulfate. Sulfate's unique, and I think I showed that in its decay rate. Um, I'll show it a little more explicitly here, and this is some research, and you can see that within contaminated aquifers, our decay rates range, our half-lives, 9 to 35 days, 7 days, 5 to 16 days, 0.1 to 0.2 days. Now, if I'm going to sit, if I'm going to, you know, set on a path to model an injectate of something that I want to know how far it's going to go and how long it's going to take there and how much do I need to inject into the ground, I absolutely need a fate and transport model with the reaction series and with the decay constant in order to say this material is only going to go 50 or 100 or you know 500 feet depending on you know what your your distance along your plume might be if you want to treat a whole plume which is what the next presentation next month will will demonstrate um you're really going to need to think about how you're modeling that injectate so the point of these last few slides is you can do groundwater modeling for injectates. We've done them. They're very useful. But when it comes down to having a reactive component such as sulfate, um, the fate transport modeling should be applied. And modeling conclusions, um, mod flow evolved such that fate and transport modeling is more accessible. Modeling alone can often support injectate design. But when we're talking about arsenic mobility um, and sulfate, the sulfate term requires fate and transport modeling, which is what we applied in our next uh, month's presentation, which hopefully everyone comes back for. And and here is sulfide or is iron sulfide in the form of pyrite for all the geologists who recognize that. And I can open up for questions um, for those that can stick around next month. We have Melanie Beck, who's going to do part two of optimizing in-situ complex metals remediation through numerical simulations. Thanks, Jim. That was a presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions for Jim, you can either uh, raise your hand or you can enter a question in the chat box. Um, so I see um, here, Chokshi. Um, hand raise, go ahead. Hey, Jim. Uh, if you go back to the fate and transport model, I think you had a chart uh, what specific, I, I might have missed it, but what specific data do you need? Uh, and how much data do we need in the modeling to get a reasonable uh, kind of estimate? Right. It would start with um, good hydraulic head synoptic data in order to calibrate the model. Um, if there are pumping wells on a site, it's better to have the flow rates from those pumping wells because then it becomes a three-dimensional calibration and then for something like what's shown here this is a field verification um so so what i did is i installed a specific conductance probe in this location and as i injected vegetable oil substrate which is a high specific conductance i was able to track the specific conductance as it arrived in this breakthrough plot so for any model, uh, synoptic hydraulic heads distributed across the site, that's that's a basic starting point. Good flow data if you have a pump and treat system and it's running and you can get your hydraulic heads while it's running. Um, and then in terms of, you know, tracing your injectate in order to identify where it's going and how far it's going, this is an example of specific conductance at the site that you will um, see next month we're tracking it with rhodamine dye, it might be rhodamine or fluorescein. We, we typically like to inject a couple of dyes along with the substrate in order to um, track that. And then that gives you the advantage of doing your field verification. Yes. Excellent. Okay. And, and Jim, just a follow up question, sorry, uh, is how much data 
do you need? Like you showed in this case one well, is that sufficient typically for model like the stuff or? Well, if we're talking about the synoptic hydraulic heads, mm -hmm. you need multiple heads all throughout the site, you know, evenly distributed, like we typically would have enough to, if you have enough to gauge your potentiometric surface, like we typically would do, then that would be sufficient there. Here, ideally we could track things over time um, and then we'd have multiple wells down gradient that, you know, might be down here and then we could we could watch this over over time. So, uh, you know, having sufficient data based on your objectives and the amount of monitoring that, that you're expecting and, and let's say the distance that you're expecting. I think I think would be the answer. It's a it's a bit more of a site specific and project objective answer, frankly. Makes sense. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I see uh, one more from uh, Melanie Beck, and then uh, that'll probably be it for questions uh, for the live part. Uh, so Melanie, please go ahead. Hey, Jim, um, great presentation. I think this will make next week's uh, much easier for me to present and much easier to follow. Uh, I just was wondering if you could describe something a little bit more that I think you glossed over, and I think it's important for uh, you know people to get the basics for numerical modeling. Can you describe what convergence is as it relates to mod flow and numerical modeling and why it's so important to having a good solution in your model? Yeah, so convergence, um, and that's a, it's a really great point, Melanie, thank you. Um, I have another presentation that has a very good slide on that. I thought about bringing it in here, but I've already presented on that. Um, convergence is the concept of numerical um, numerical solution. So a numerical model looks at a complex problem, a differential equation, and solves it many different times and compares the results of each one of those solutions and reduces the difference in those solutions again and again and again and again and again. So and it, and it looks like an attenuating sine wave, like it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually you reach so-called convergence, which is when your error between your solutions is less than your um, prescribed convergence criteria. So what that means is a numerical model will solve heads everywhere then solve them again, then look at the difference, and then do that, you know, many, 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 many times. As that difference in head drops, once it goes below something that you've specified, like 0 0.001 feet, for example, we know we can't measure that well. We can't measure a hydraulic head less than probably 0 0.001 feet. And if when you when your model is more accurate than what you can measure in the field then it's acceptable. Um, and that's important for numeric models because they're an approximation um, by design, but you want that approximation to be um, as accurate as you need it. And for clarification, um, it's next month's webinar, August 11th. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jim. Great presentation and looking forward to next month with Melanie. And with that, folks, we will uh, close the webinar for today. Thanks for joining. All right, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you joining.